Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second annual international conference on chemical uh, on chemistry, chemical engineering, and chemical process, or the CCECP 2014. On behalf of Global Science and Technology Forum, we would like to uh, welcome you to this conference here in Singapore. Uh, introduce our keynote speakers for this morning. We'll first, introduce um, the professor of chemistry at the University of Melbourne. He completed his undergraduate degree in chemistry at the University of Sofia, Bulgaria, in 1982. And in, in 1988, he obtained his PhD in the area of analytical chemistry from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics from Hungary. Um, he then worked as senior assistant professor in analytical chemistry at the University of Sofia until 1990, when he took a two-year postdoctoral position in the Laboratory of Chemical Analysis at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And then after this, he returned to the University of Sofia, where he was promoted at, uh, to chief assistant professor. Uh, he's, um, in 2001, he joined the School of Chemistry at the University of Melbourne as a lecturer, and he was promoted to senior lecturer in 2003. Uh, he's associate professor and reader in 2007, and he's now a professor uh, since 2012, and now he's a research group of 10 postgraduate students and four postdoctoral researchers. Um, he is responsible for the analytical and environmental chemistry teaching in this school and is a team leader in the Victorian Center for Aquatic Pollution and the Identification and Management, or CAPIM. And in 2011, he was the president of the Melbourne University Chem Chemical Society founded in 1903. Let's all welcome Professor Spassky. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, lengthy introduction. Uh, in the next 20-25 minutes, uh, I'll uh, talk about uh, my research in the area of uh, polymer inclusion membranes and uh, the application of these uh, membranes uh, uh, in um, industry and um, chemical analysis. Uh, I'll start first with uh, uh, the most popular technique which is uh, used for separation in um, industry and chemical analysis, which is solvent extraction. Uh, now this technique is, is so popular because it offers high selectivity, high flexibility, and high enrichment factors. Unfortunately, it involves the use of large uh, amounts of solvents, and most of these solvents are, of course, flammable, toxic, and volatile. So uh, uh, the use of, uh, of, of these solvents is of considerable environmental and health concern. In addition, of course, uh, they have finite solubility in water, and they uh, uh, contaminate the, the raffinate and also uh, because of the loss of, uh, of these solvents to the raffinate and also the loss of extractants to the raffinate, the cost of the separation process increases. And in some cases, it is necessary to uh, back extract uh, the chemical species from the organic phase into an aqueous phase for further processing. And when conventional solvent extraction is used, uh, these two processes must be conducted sequentially, which uh, increases the duration of the separation process and, of course, increases its cost. Uh, separation based on liquid membranes uh, is an attractive alternative to conventional solvent extraction because uh, uh, it, in this way, it's possible to drastically reduce the amounts of solvents used. In some cases, it's possible to completely eliminate the use of solvents. At the same time, uh, liquid membranes offer the high selectivity, flexibility, and enrichment factors which are provided by uh, conventional solvent extraction. In addition, uh, the separation process is, uh, is much cheaper. Uh, because small quantities of extractants are used, and this actually allows the use of um, extractants which are very expensive but highly selective. Uh, the use of such extractants, of course, is not economically viable in uh, large-scale solvent extraction processes in industry. Um, also, uh, most of the extractants which are used in uh, liquid membranes have bactericidal properties, and for this reason, uh, these membranes are practically immune to biofouling, which is uh, uh, very different from uh, the situation with most other membranes which are used in uh, uh, separation processes. And, of course, it's uh, very easy to integrate the extraction and back extraction processes into a single step because both processes take place simultaneously on both sides of the membrane. The membrane basically uh, separates uh, uh, the feed phase from the receiving phase and the extraction takes place at the feed phase membrane interface 
and uh, the back extraction process takes place at the same time at the other side of the membrane, at the membrane uh, receiving phase interface. So this simplifies the separation process and makes it cheaper. The main types of uh, liquid membranes are listed in this slide. These are bulk liquid membranes, emulsion liquid membranes, supported liquid membranes, and polymer inclusion membranes. Uh, I'll talk later on about uh, polymer inclusion membranes, but just a few words about the first three types of membranes. Uh, for ex with bulk liquid, membra bulk liquid membranes, this is a, a schematic of a typical bulk liquid membrane. The problem with bulk liquid membranes is that uh, the interfacial surface area between the organic phase and uh, the two aqueous phases, the feet and the uh, receiving phases, uh, is not particularly large. And uh, for this reason, the efficiency of the mass transfer process is not that good. Uh, well, this uh, problem um, can be easily resolved by using uh, an emulsion liquid membrane, and this is a schematic of a typical emulsion liquid membrane, which is basically a double emulsion. Uh, <coughs> the emulsion globules uh, incorporate the organic phase and, um, and the receiving phase, the, the, uh, the white circles. Uh, the mass transfer process here is very efficient uh, because uh, uh, there is a, a very large um, interfacial surface area between the organic phase and the two aqueous phases. Also, enrichment factors uh, can be very high because of the large ratio between uh, the volumes uh, of, uh, uh, of the, of the uh, feed phase and the receiving phases. Uh, uh, however, there are issues associated uh, with the formation and the breakdown of the emulsion, and, uh, and these difficulties actually have limited uh, the use of emulsion liquid membranes, uh, both in industry and chemical analysis. The same uh, applies to uh, bulk liquid membranes. Well, supported liquid membranes are arguably the most popular liquid membranes these days uh, for two basic reasons. First of all, their structure is very simple. Uh, a supported liquid membrane basically consists of a macroporous hydrophobic membrane, uh, which is impregnated with the organic phase. And the organic phase uh, remains in the pores of the membrane by capillary forces. So they are very easy to make. Uh, and very easy to use because they, uh, they can uh, easily separate the feed and uh, receiving phases. The main uh, weakness of supported liquid membranes is, uh, is their relatively short lifetime because of the slow leaching of the organic phase into the adjacent aqueous phases. And finally, polymer inclusion membranes. Uh, uh, they are a relatively new type of uh, self-supporting liquid membranes which uh, resemble to some extent uh, uh, supported liquid membranes, uh, though their structure is very different, and as we'll see a little bit later, their properties are different. Uh, a polymer inclusion membrane incorporates uh, a base polymer, which is in most cases PVC or cellulose triacetate. Uh, also, uh, it incorporates an extractant, and in most cases the extractants used are uh, uh, commercial uh, solvent extractants uh, like those listed in this slide. But as I mentioned earlier, it's possible to use uh, uh, sp sp specially synthesized extractants which are expensive but highly selective for the target chemical species. Uh, in most cases, the extractants uh, have uh, uh, plasticizing properties, but in some cases it might be necessary to incorporate uh, a plasticizer uh, to improve the, uh, uh, the uh, flexibility of the membrane by improving the compatibility between uh, the base polymer and the extractant, uh, and thus reduce the glass transition temperature of the membrane. In some cases, a modifier may be required. The role of the modifier is to improve the solubility of the extracted chemical species uh, uh, in uh, the membrane liquid phase. Uh, a good polymer inclusion membrane is homogeneous at macroscopic level. It's optically transparent and for this reason these membranes can be used for the construction of optical chemical sensors or optodes. And it is flexible and mechanically strong. It can withstand mechanical stress such as bending without tearing or visually deforming. Uh, Surface and structural studies of polymer inclusion membranes have revealed that uh, these membranes incorporate networks of nano-sized channels where the membrane liquid phase is located. And for that reason, these membranes are uh, much more stable uh, than supported liquid membranes. This is the, the, the main advantage of uh, polymer inclusion membranes because, of, of course, of the reduced loss of, uh, of the membrane liquid phase. And uh, polymer inclusion membranes can be made very easily. Uh, basically, what you need to do is dissolve the base polymer, the extractant, and, if necessary, plasticizer and modifier in a suitable solvent. 
For PVC membranes, tetrahydrofurane is an excellent solvent, while for uh, uh, cellulose stracitate based membranes, uh, one can use dichloromethane. And then this solution can be poured into a mold, for example, a glass ring as shown here, positioned on a flat, flat glass plate or petri dish, and the solvent uh, uh, will evaporate uh, uh, in a few hours and uh, uh, a polymer inclusion membrane will be formed on, on, uh, on the glass plate in this particular case and it can be easily peeled from, uh, from the glass plate and used. And this is a, a photograph of, uh, of a typical polymer inclusion membrane. Uh, we have uh, uh, used polymer inclusion membranes in, in various areas and I have listed some of these areas. For example, in the separation of metallic and non-metallic species of industrial and environmental interest. Online separation and pre-concentration of analytes in flow injection analysis, passive sampling, manufacturing of monolayers of metallic nanoparticles and construction of optical uh, chemical sensors or optical detectors, also called optodes, paper-based microfluidic devices and electrochemical sensors. However, uh, due to the limited time I have to deliver this lecture, I'll give you only two examples of uh, the application of polymer inclusion membranes. One is uh, uh, for the separation of thiocyanate from tailings and groundwaters, and uh, the other application is for online separation and pre-concentration in the flow injection determination of zinc. Uh, in uh, these days, uh, uh, in most uh, gold mines, gold is um, extracted uh, with, uh, with cyanide. And uh, uh, the processed gold ore plus the cyanide solution um, are stored in uh, tailings dams. Large quantities of water are required for the flotation process uh, and also for the gold leaching process. And due to restrictions um, in the use of fresh water, it is necessary very often to reuse uh, uh, the wastewater in the tailings dams. However, there is a problem because uh, uh, cyanide reacts with sulfidic minerals and produces thiocyanate. And thiocyanate makes uh, 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 sulfidic uh, minerals uh, more hydrophilic. So actually during the flotation process, uh, uh, there is a loss uh, of, uh, of, uh, of gold, uh, of particles containing gold, uh, and this uh, loss can reach up to 5 to 10 percent, which in monetary terms is, is quite a substantial um, uh, loss. And uh, for this reason, it's necessary to eliminate, to, to remove thiocyanate from uh, the tailings water be before it can be reused. At the same time, thiocyanate enters groundwater, in, um, uh, which is uh, in the proximity of the gold mine, of the tailings dam, and uh, thiocyanate is toxic to aquatic organisms and, and uh, uh, must be removed from the groundwater. Uh, during the operation of the mine, this groundwater can be collected in the tailings dam, but of course uh, there is a problem uh, when the mine is closed and uh, thiocyanate must be removed for a period of approximately 10 to 20 years after mine closure. As a result of all this, it becomes obvious that uh, we need uh, uh, processes for the separation of thiocyanate from tailings and groundwaters, which are inexpensive, energy efficient, uh, and uh, preferably can be uh, conducted in a continuous fashion. And for this reason, we decided to uh, attempt to develop a polymer inclusion membrane-based method uh, for the separation of thiocyanate uh, from uh, uh, tailings water. Uh, we screened a considerable number of membranes with different uh, uh, compositions. Uh, uh, we used PVC and CTA, uh, various extractants and modifiers, uh, and uh, we arrived at this composition as the optimal composition. 20% uh, aliquot 336, 10% tetradecanol, and 70% uh, uh, PVC. The aliquot 336 is actually a commercial extractant, uh, which uh, uh, is a mixture of quaternary or ammonium chlorides, uh, with the dominant species being methyl trioctyl ammonium chloride, shown here. And it's an excellent uh, anion exchanger, and for this reason it's very suitable for the uh, separation of thiocyanate, which is an anion. Uh, we used uh, tetradecanol as uh, modifier and PVC as the base polymer. The membrane was prepared in exactly the same way uh, I mentioned earlier. And this is a, a photograph of, uh, of a typical membrane. Uh, the mechanism, uh, which uh, uh, the mass transfer mechanism across the membrane is uh, uh, shown schematically in this uh, slide. Uh, 
we used uh, uh, as the stripping reagent, uh, not hydrochloric acid or, or a chloride salt, uh, but uh, nitrate, uh, uh, sodium nitrate, because uh, uh, we established that actually sodium ni nitrate uh, uh, was a better stripping reagent than, uh, uh, than chloride-based uh, uh, stripping reagents. Um, and uh, uh, for this reason, uh, we used one molar sodium nitrate as, uh, the, st as uh, uh, the stripping reagent. And as a result of this, uh, basically, uh, aliquot chloride was converted uh, into aliquot nitrate. So at the feed uh, uh, solution membrane interface, this ion exchange process takes place. Thiocyanate replaces nitrate. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the membrane, and uh, an ion pair is formed, which is uh, uh, a thiocyanate uh, uh, ion pair with uh, uh, a, quater uh, a quaternary uh, ammonium cation, and this ion pair diffuses across the membrane to the other side of the membrane, which is in contact with the receiving solution. Since the receiving solution contains high concentration of nitrate, the same ion exchange process takes place, but uh, 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 the equilibrium is shifted in the opposite direction towards stripping thiocyanate from the membrane and replacing it with nitrate. So uh, the original nitrate uh, quaternary ammonium uh, ion, uh, uh, ion pair is formed as a result of this, which diffuses back to the uh, feed solution interface to pick up another thiocyanate uh, anion. And uh, uh, this is a typical example of facilitated mass transport. And facilitated mass transport allows uh, transport uh, against the concentration gradient uh, uh, because this mass transport is driven by the high concentration of the stripping reagent uh, in uh, uh, the receiving phase, as shown schematically in this figure. Uh, we uh, uh, conducted extensive studies uh, on this membrane system. Uh, we did some mathematical modeling to determine uh, extraction constants and diffusion coefficients within the membrane. But ultimately, we had to prove that uh, this membrane is stable enough so it can be used uh, uh, for uh, uh, the separation of uh, uh, thiocyanate from uh, uh, tailings water in a continuous fashion for relatively prolonged periods of time. For this reason, we constructed uh, uh, a separation unit, which is uh, shown schematically in this figure. This is a photograph of the unit, uh, which consists of two halves, uh, uh, each equipped with a meander-shaped channel, and the two channels are separated by a flat sheet uh, polymer inclusion membrane. Uh, one channel is for the uh, feed solution, and the other channel is for the receiving solution. Uh, we tried co-current and counter-current uh, flow configurations, and as expected, of course, the counter-current uh, configuration was more efficient. Uh, we conducted uh, uh, two series um, of experiments uh, with 100 milligrams per liter thiocyanate and 1,000 milligrams per liter thiocyanate. And I should have mentioned before that uh, the thiocyanate concentration in mine tailings can reach up to 1,000 milligrams per liter. So in the first series of experiment with 100 milligrams per liter, we used only one uh, separation unit. Uh, and uh, these are the results which we obtained. This is, this, these are the transient concentrations of thiocyanate in, uh, in the feed solution, uh, in the effluent feed solution, and in the effluent receiving solution. And as you can see, the, the feed solution, which originally contained 100 milligrams per liter, didn't contain any thiocyanate uh, after leaving the separation um, unit, while all this cyanate obviously was transferred uh, to the receiving solution. And uh, this uh, unit operated uh, uh, uninterruptedly for almost uh, three months, 100 days, more than three months actually, uh, which uh, actually illustrated the, the excellent uh, stability of uh, the proposed polymer inclusion membrane. But of course, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the concentration of thiocyanate may, may could be much higher than 100 milligrams per liter. And, and that's why in the, in the second series of experiments, uh, we used uh, 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 thiocyanate feed solution with concentration 1,000 milligrams per liter. In this case, we had to use three units uh, uh, in, in a series. Uh, and as you can see, in this case, uh, we could operate uh, this system continuously for practically 140 days. We had, we had to stop the experiment simply because the PhD student running it had to start writing up their thesis. Uh, and as you can see, again, the results um, indicate excellent uh, stability of the membrane. And on, on the basis of these results, uh, uh, it can be concluded that the proposed polymer inclusion membrane-based separation technology provides an inexpensive, environmentally friendly, and reliable means of the thiocyanate cleanup of gold mine tailings waters.
Uh, a few words about the second application of polymer inclusion membranes, this time in chemical analysis. Uh, polymer inclusion membranes can be used for online separation and pre-concentration in flow injection analysis. Flow injection analysis is a powerful flow-through technique for solution manipulation prior to detection. It was introduced back in 1974, and since then there are more than 30,000 papers in the literature, so it has become a very popular technique, both in research and uh, <coughs> routine analysis. Uh, this is a schematic of a typical flow injection analyzer, which consists of a propelling device, which is usually a multi-channel um, uh, peristaltic pump, uh, uh, an injection device, which is usually a, a rotary injection valve, very similar to those used in um, liquid chromatography, by means of which a well-defined volume of the sample is introduced into uh, a carrier stream. And this carrier stream may contain a reagent, or reagent may be introduced through a separate uh, stream, and the analyte reacts in, uh, with this reagent in the mixing code to produce a product that can be sensed by the detector incorporated in the flow through measuring cell of the analyzer. And finally, a peak-shaped uh, signal is recorded, and usually peak height can be related to the analyte concentration. Uh, well, this uh, uh, technique uh, uh, can be implemented in uh, portable instruments. Uh, it's inexpensive, uh, and these portable instruments can be used successfully for online monitoring in remote locations or for on-site monitoring in um, industry. Uh, to keep the instruments cheap, of course, the detectors must be cheap, and that's why uh, the detectors which are usually used in flow injection analyzers are spectrophotometric or electrochemical detectors. But unfortunately, these detectors can experience serious interferences with samples containing complex matrices. For this reason, various uh, online uh, separation steps must be introduced in the flow injection procedure, such as distillation, uh, dialysis, um, gas diffusion, pervaporation, or liquid-liquid extraction. And that's why we decided to, to check whether we could use polymer inclusion membranes for uh, conducting online extractive separation in flow injection analysis. And we selected zinc as our model analyte. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, we uh, used a membrane which contained, again, PVC as the base polymer, but a different extractant, a diethylhexylphosphoric acid, shown here, which is an acidic extractant. And as a, a modifier, we use dioctyl phthalate. So this, is, uh, this membrane uh, was introduced in the extraction cell. And this is a photograph of the extraction cell. The extraction cell is very similar to the uh, separation unit uh, I showed you earlier. Uh, they are again two halves, uh, each equipped with meander-shaped channel. And they are separated by the membrane. Uh, the samples were introduced uh, in uh, the donor stream. And uh, when the sample zone uh, passed through uh, the extraction cell, uh, zinc uh, uh, was extracted into the membrane, uh, forming a complex with, with diethylhexylphosphoric acid. Diethylhexylphosphoric acid is present as a dimer um, in uh, the organic phase, and, uh, and this is the, uh, the stoichiometry of the corresponding zinc complex. And then this complex, of course, uh, diffuses across the membrane, and zinc is stripped uh, in uh, uh, the acceptor solution containing uh, relatively high concentration of hydrochloric acid. Uh, uh, then uh, the acceptor solution is neutralized with uh, a reagent solution containing sodium hydroxide, uh, and then mixed with another reagent solution at this confluence point, which contains uh, the, uh, uh, the calorimetric reagent, pyridyl azoresorcinol, which is a uh, frequently used calorimetric reagent at pH 9.3, borate buffer. And it forms uh, an orange colored complex with zinc, which was monitored continuously in the flow through spectrophotometric cell at uh, 491 nanometers. Uh, we optimized the main design and operational parameters of this system, and uh, these are the analytical figures of merit, the characteristics of the system. Um, the, the, the detection limit was quite good, as you can see, 50 micrograms per liter. Uh, repeatability was also quite good, uh, uh, expressed as relative standard deviation 3.4%. And also uh, uh, quite a decent linear range. This is the, the corresponding calibration curve. And we applied this method to uh, real samples, uh, uh, two pharmaceutical samples and, and several uh, samples from the galvanizing industry. The same samples were also analyzed by the standard method, which in this case is atomic absorption spectrometry. And as you can see, very good uh, uh, agreement was obtained between the two methods, uh, which uh, can be used for validation uh, of, uh, of the proposed flow injection method. 
and it's worth mentioning that actually uh, the samples uh, uh, must be filtered before uh, conducting atomic absorption spectrometric measurement, while uh, it was not necessary when using the, uh, the flow injection method. And on the basis of the results obtained, it can be concluded that the use of polymer inclusion membranes in flow injection analysis shows a considerable promise for the selective separation and pre-concentration of analytes prior to their analytical measurement. And of course, this uh, work was conducted by a number of people. Uh, uh, this is a, a photograph of, uh, of uh, most of my research group. Uh, uh, the uh, major players in this research were uh, uh, honorary professorial fellow uh, Bob Cattrall and um, uh, Yong Su, a PhD student who did the tile cyanate work. Unfortunately, the, the student who did uh, uh, the zinc work is, is not in this, uh, in this photograph because she uh, left. And finally, I would like uh, to thank the organizers of this excellent conference for allowing me to present this talk and for inviting me to give this talk uh, and attend this excellent conference. And um, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And these are some pho selected photographs from Melbourne University. This is the School of Chemistry. And there are some other interesting buildings, both old and modern. Thank you. Yes? Can you say a little bit more about the morphology of these membranes? So you mentioned nanopores. Do you have any uh, well that's, the, well, that's an excellent question. Uh, it's an excellent question because actually uh, there is some research conducted on uh, a polymer inclusion membranes using conventional and synchrotron-based techniques. Uh, uh, sex measurements actually suggest that uh, uh, these membranes, uh, ex at least polymer inclusion membranes, but not actually polymer inclusion membranes, uh, Similar membranes um, are also used in, uh, in polymer-based ion-selective electrodes. And they're called plasticized membranes. So there is a lot of work on plasticized membranes, which are basically polymer plasticizer and a very small amount of extractant. Because in an ion-selective electrode, of course, uh, the, the mass transfer across the membrane must be minimal, unlike in polymer inclusion membranes. Well, there, there are two hypotheses. One is one, one hypothesis is exactly diffusion of uh, the ion pair or the complex across the membrane. The other hypothesis is that this uh, 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 takes place uh, as a result of a hopping mechanism, where uh, the chemical species extracted actually hops between um, uh, extractant uh, ions or molecules. So it's hard to tell which, which works, but uh, these sex measurements have uh, indicated uh, uh, that actually a, a PVC-based membrane uh, consists of uh, a nanocrystals of PVC uh, of the order of uh, maybe um, 10 nanometers. And then they're surrounded of, uh, uh, with plasticized PVC. And then probably in between is the, the liquid phase. So basically, uh, it's a hard, hard sphere uh, model, which uh, can be viewed as uh, a structure which consists of nano-sized channels, because that's the difference between, um, th this is the, the distance uh, between uh, the hard spheres. Percolated spheres. Yeah. But that, this is only one, one study. We've done a lot of, of work on this using various techniques. Uh, uh, so far, the membranes look quite homogeneous, but there is, uh, um, we have to do a lot more work to be absolutely sure what the structure is. One of the things that we worked on for, uh, for uh, uh, polymers, uh, I understand that right for fuel cells. Yeah. 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 I'm just thinking uh, some simple question. For this polymer inclusion methods, uh, what are the limits for the operating pressure temperature? And can this be used for gas operation? Uh, well, we have conducted actually experiments at elevated temperatures uh, in this zinc system actually. I uh, didn't have time to talk about it. Uh, and up to 50 degrees, the membranes operated fine. Actually, there was no deterioration in the, in the membrane performance. Uh, however, uh, the stability of, uh, of the membrane uh, uh, started to decrease at temperatures above 50. So we uh, conduct experiments up to 70 degrees centigrade, but up to 50 was all right. Uh, well, the other question was... Uh, Whether they can be used for gas 
for gases. Uh, there, is, uh, there is no reason why they couldn't be used uh, for gases, uh, uh, provided that, of course, uh, I suppose on the receiving side you have a solution. Any other questions? Well, uh, one, one more. <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, the picking of the assistant uh, in the ion uh, transport process, uh, what are the general principles? You said sodium nitrate is better than, than uh, sodium chloride. The night, uh, what, what determines whether yeah. a particular... Uh, what, 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 how, how do you guide the choice of, of the... Yes. Uh, well, it generally follows the Hofmeister series. So uh, the, the, N, uh, the, the, the affinity of the membrane to, the, to a particular anion is determined to a great extent by the hydrophobicity of that anion. So that's why pyrocyanate is extracted preferentially, let's say, to chloride and nitrate. And nitrate is extracted preferentially to chloride. So we, uh, we have to use, on the receiving side, high concentration of nitrate to shift the equilibrium. So basically, organic anions will be extracted much more preferentially than inorganic anions. But it all depends on, uh, on, on the product as well. Regeneration of the membrane. Uh, well, it's automatically regenerated because you have a uh, uh, receiving solution on one side, and this uh, receiving solution contains the stripping reagent in high enough concentration. So, uh, according to the yeah, you, you can see here, yeah. it's automatically regenerated at this side, and that's why this mass transport mechanism actually allows uh, transport uh, apparently against the concentration gradient. In reality, of course, it's, uh, the situation is much more complex. It's actually driven by the concentration of the stripping reagent. As long as you keep this concentration high enough, then we have conducted transport experiments where we transport completely, 100%, uh, the target species from the feed solution to the receiving solution. And it looks on first glance as though we've done transport against the concentration gradient. Well, if there are no more questions, I would like to, to thank you again for, for your attention.